welcome to our time. He is a professional actor with more than 50 years experience in theatre, TV, films, narration and voiceovers. He's also been a specialist in ceremonies and celebrations. He is Patrick Frost. <laughs> Patrick, how's that? Did anybody ever introduce you like that before? Not quite Straight like off that. LinkedIn. But I fully <laughs> expected it from you, Malcolm. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've always been aware of this show. I've watched it before and I've... Um, and you'll never watch it yearning, again. But had a bit of a yearning to be on it, to be quite oh, honest. Oh, brilliant. So thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, that's my pleasure. Patrick, what's interesting is in this country, we rarely get to talk to actors who are genuine actors. They talk to stars but not always to the actors who play all those other roles and you've certainly played all those other roles. Indeed, yes. How did you start playing roles? Were you a small child at school? Oh, I was well, a Well, I suppose of a... you were a small child at school <laughs> but did you start playing the roles as a small child? I was a bit of a show-off, I guess. Um, perhaps a little bit insecure as a young person so, yes, the, the class clown in a way. Um, I had no idea at, at any time really that I was at school that you would anybody would ever be able to make a living out of doing this and having fun and showing off. Mm. But um, when I got to university, I, <laughs> I, I won a scholarship, so my parents encouraged me to try something ambitious and I, I went for a medical degree. I was a couple <laughs> of years into it and somebody came into the refectory one day, funnily enough, and said, would you like to be in a play? And of course I hadn't done anything like that since I'd been at school and I said, yeah, sure. Anything to get me away from cutting up dead bodies and being in the lecture theatre all day and so on. So I took that on and I just had a bit of a ball. I was right into Monty Python at the time actually. So oh, really? I was mimicking and clowning and fooling about with accents and that sort of thing. And few people were quite impressed so I got invited down to Theatre 62, the forerunner of Star Theatres and um, yeah, started working professionally there and then was eventually invited into the State Theatre Company Ensemble. Well really that's where the State Theatre Company started wasn't it? Indeed, they were called the South Australian Theatre Company in yes. those days yep. um, when George Ogilvie was appointed as their director and he of course was a wonderful teacher and a fabulous mentor for me because I didn't go to NIDA, I wasn't trained at university to be an actor, I just learned on the job. I suppose you could say I was sort of apprenticed because quite often yes. I was... Well, well weren't we all in, was, the, in those days? Yes, indeed. I was at the back of the stage quite often and watching the stars down front and soaking it all up and yep. learning as fast as I could. I think that's sadly lacking these days in many ways because the opportunities just aren't there. I was talking to somebody, we both worked with Tom Fairley today, oh, yes. who was one of probably the most amazing Humphrey Bear characters Absolutely. that there ever was. And we were just talking about the fact that most of us learnt, uh, like if you're a dancer, you went to classes, but you really learnt the finer details of being a performer rather than just a dancer. Same as more of a performer rather than just an actor playing somebody who looked like you. Yeah. You'd learn how to make up, you'd learn how to change your body shape, wear different shoes, wear a tiger exactly. belt or whatever you needed yes, to. Yes, indeed, yeah. So we've got some <coughs> photos of your career. Uh, and what's interesting about that is this is chronological. Just where are you in that shot? Oh, oh that's me in the foreground. The fuzzy the, one. The fuzzy one with the blonde hair and the leather jacket, yes. How old We're were you then? We're in a production called Saved. It was by Edward Bond set in London. Well, we did it in the, at the 1970 Festival of Arts. Right, was, and there's cameras there, why is that? Oh, well, it was a very controversial show because um, there was a scene in it where a group of young thugs, really, yeah. stoned a baby in a cot, stoned it to death in oh. a uh, pusher. So um, the uh, ABC had a program called Today, Tonight, which you remember um, I do. A sort of forerunner to the 7.30, I suppose. Well, Paula Nagel, whose program follows this one here in South Australia, uh, Paula was one of the uh, reporters on that show. That's, in, uh, that's mm. exactly right. I mm. remember Paula, of course. So, uh, it, because the show was so controversial and there was such an uproar about it, I think people wanted it closed. Um, we had people fainting in the audience, all oh, sorts goodness. of issues. So, this, this shot they here, this came is... To, um, what to talk the, to us about it. Amazing. This is of the original... Yes. That's George Ogilvie, our director, and that's the ensemble, some of the ensemble of actors who were in the original South Australian Theatre Company set up in the early 70s and it opened the Playhouse in 1973. Um, 
that was a wonderful time because I hadn't been trained as an actor. I was able to work with them and learn my craft and so on. So I was very, very pleased mm. as a young dad to have a job that paid me every week. And <laughs> well, so isn't on. that the truth? Yes. Because being an actor is, you know, for most actors, you have to have another job mm. because you can't be an actor full time. But you've done an amazing job. Now, in this next shot... Look at you in the middle. Yes, that's me there with a... Uh, it's a French farce called A Certified Marriage. And George had trained in France with the famous mime artists and so on, so he loved the French theatre. Um, of course, this was a translation. Um, I'm wearing a false nose because I wanted to look even sillier than the character actually <laughs> is. That's Daphne Grey that I'm speaking to there, Martin Redpath b b next to me, and in the background there, Don Barker and Julie Hamilton. So some of the great stalwarts of oh, Adelaide theatre. here theater. in South Australia, yeah. yes, I can understand that. Did you... We were talking before about not having the training. These were the people that more or less trained you, I yes, guess. Yes, that's exactly right, yes. And so guest actors came in from... Sydney too sometimes, and I work with some of the really greats. Patricia Kennedy. Um, oh, right. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of the wonderful actors that, um, that they were playing at the Sydney Theatre Company and so on. So eventually we got to be of such a standard that they were prepared to tour our shows. So when we opened the Playhouse, um, I was in a production of a David Williamson play, which was brand new, commissioned for our company. He didn't want them... To, uh, to, to do their own productions, the Melbourne Theatre Company and the, and the mm. old Toto, as it was called then. So we toured our production. So at the age of 25, an untrained actor from little old Adelaide got to tour and play in the great cities of Australia. And, yeah, my career took off after that, I've got to say. It was yeah, great. it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Well, in shows like this with this photo... Yes, so Journey's End. So we hadn't got into the Playhouse yet. We were in the old... I think that was in the Royalty Theatre, actually, oh, because yes. I remember that was set in a, in a uh, dugout in a trench in World War I, British officers, and uh, we, were we were blown up by a mortar and the set collapsed at the end of the production, <laughs> at the end of the night. So, I love it. Uh, but I love you there with the little moustache, very yes, English yeah, at the time. Terribly English and, and very um, nervous and timid and didn't want to go into battle at all. Hmm. A bit of a coward, in fact. Quite a tricky role to play, that one. Yeah, it's mm. amazing, isn't it? So, um, well, there's a lot more of these, so let's have another look because sure. it's good sort of following your career. Look at you there being very suave. This is the cherry orchard. Well, Yashin is not quite as suave as he you thinks suave, he is. You look suave, yes. It's the cherry orchard, and uh, that's um, Leslie Damon there with the guitar. Uh, Yeppe Holdoff, and he, he became he, quite famous. Was it on on homicide. homicide? He went to homicide. Yes, I think he'd already been on homicide actually by the time we got to do this. This was in the later seventies. But you know, that's a compliment to you, uh, seeing you sitting there very suavely going that. That that came across just in the photo. You yes. know, part of being an actor is to be able to communicate something without words, yes. isn't it? Yes, he's very insecure, and he's hoping to get something happening with the lovely Dunyasha who's sitting next to him there, which doesn't quite eventuate. <laughs> She's got much better prospects, but he's Some memories of these shows, isn't it? The yes. interesting yes. memories that come back to you when you see the photos. I always admire actors that can do their speeches from their shows. I've never been able to do that, but I can quite often remember particular yes. moments from the shows. Did you ever yeah. play Hamlet? I never got to play Hamlet, I'm afraid. Oh, well, no. what about this one here? That's a pretty unusual one. Yeah, this is actually from a film that I shot in the 80s called Coda. It was a um, mystery murder thriller, sort of, about a serial killer operating in a music school. So all the um, victims were musicians. And uh, they, I had to, they had to um, unpleasant you up a bit. Yes, well, I became a uh, suspect in the, in the murder. Uh, because I was the ex-wife of Penny Cook, who was the right. protagonist in the oh, film. Yes, she became very famous. Um, so, uh, because I was her ex-husband, uh, some suspicion arose. They took my photograph to the police sketch artist, and, of course, he said, well, this chap is no criminal. And oh, so yeah, can we have a look at that photo again? Because I love the fact what they did with your eyes. They made one eye smaller than the other. Yeah. 
and and that heavy lidded left eye. So the director said, "Well, make him look like one." So yes. that's the result. Well, you, you it do. Hangs, it hangs on the wall in my living room. I like that. That's a great <laughs> shot. I love that. And of course, I it was a prop, so they didn't need it at the end of the shoot. So at the wrap party, I got presented with. Yes. It. Well, there are those things, those little bits and pieces that people do sort of uh, casually fall in their pocket from yes. a film. Oh yes. Because yes. they're special to the actor. Yes. You know, because yes, it means a lot, like the mm. lightsabers with. Star Wars and yeah, stuff, they exactly. all you know, got that little one <laughs> mounted somewhere. <laughs> all right, more of your career, Patrick. Here's another shot. So this is uh, into the 90s now. Um, now, this was actually the only amateur production I ever got involved with because I found out that um, the, the wonderful Rob Crozer at Independent Theatre wanted to mm -hmm. do a production of A Streetcar Named Desire, a, a play I've always loved, and I always wanted to play Mitch. So I asked him and he said, by all means. So I got into that with Catherine Fisher there playing Blanche well, and she wasn't blonde. I thought that was a good choice. It's OK. Yeah. But good because that would have given some other younger people that were watching you from your experience learn the way that you'd learned. Yes, indeed. When yeah, you that's were young. exactly it's important what to hand happened. it over. Yes, indeed. Um, we got some more photos. Mm -hmm. This one here that looks more like you today. Well, indeed, yes, I'm uh, now getting uh, a little more elderly and a lot more hair. Um, this was a production called The Lake, written by a local writer, actually, Ben Brooker, a mm -hmm. wonderful playwright, critic, essayist. Um, yes, and uh, he's working on a book, actually, at the moment. So um, this play was done at the, at the Holden Street Theatres at Hindmarsh, mm -hmm. And as we were developing it, because it's based in a sort of um, dystopian future uh, where there's, there's no um, civilization, so we thought, how are we going to show... They virtually were living in a derelict old uh, building which had half collapsed. How are we going to create the light in here? And the lighting designer came up with a wonderfully brilliant idea that the audience would all have a torch. Oh. And we had no lights... Oh, you okay. didn't see anything unless you switched on your torch oh, right. and, and pointed it at what us. That's a great idea. So everybody cooperated. It was a small audience each night. Yeah, That's, we deliberately about working set in the it dark, up that though. way. But it, yes, it wasn't. Oh, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you need to have a torch yourself so you could say. Yes. Well, speaking of uh, doing things in the dark, we've got to take a quick break and we'll be back in a tick. Welcome back to our time. Our special guest is Patrick Frost. Patrick, we've just sort of watched your pro your process of ageing as an actor, but the reality is you've done so many parts in so many films and played so many different characters. Name drop a bit if you can, if oh. you remember. Well, I suppose the most intimidating actor I ever worked with was James Coburn. Oh. I went to Melbourne to screen test for this role uh, and drove all the way home thinking, I wonder if I'll ever get that. And sure enough, my agent called and said, yes, you've got it. So I had to go back to actually shoot it. It was a difficult shoot, a wonderful story about a, a serial killer in Melbourne. It was based on a true story, of course. There's a something serial... happening here. Hang on. The... Now, so we've seen somewhere you're killers of children and it's... are you cast as... Not always. Killers there? In fact, quite <laughs> No, I've seen you as um, lawyers, judges and all sorts of most things. Most times I'm quite a nice character, yes. the doctor or the dad yes, or the, the lawyer yes. or so on, but I, I particularly relish the sort of nastier characters sometimes. Doesn't every But in actor. this case, I wasn't anybody like that. I, I was a, um, a, t a telegraph officer working out of the Melbourne headquarters of the Australian Defence Force um, and, the, and James Coburn's character playing the lead came in because he was a lawyer defending the serial killer that the local police had just arrested. And he didn't want this chap to be tried in Melbourne, of course. He wanted to take him away to an American uh, military justice and, and um, get rid of him because he was a bit of an embarrassment. Um, Amazing. So uh, James came in. We, we rehearsed the scene. He, uh, we shot it a couple of times. And about the third take, I realised... Mr. Coburn is ad-libbing. So I thought, well, I'm, I've, I can't use the lines I've got. I've got to respond to what he's actively saying. So that's what I did. And I think we shot it all in about three or four takes and everybody was very happy. But oh, I, I was so concerned about my accent because at that time, this is in the early 80s, 
Australians weren't considered able to even do an American accent. No. So I came onto the set, got into the makeup chair and was speaking with my American accent because I didn't really know anybody from Melbourne. I hadn't worked right. much in Melbourne at that time. So I, yes, I was using my accent right through the entire shoot. Like I'd read about some actors, you know, being in the role and that sort of thing. Being and I thought, the, yes. if I'm meant to be American, I'll be one. And it seemed to well, work. Yeah. Mm. Well, I suppose you do. You sort of have to lead from... You, a bit different to the stage where your audience is usually further away... Yes. ..because the camera's right up in your face so yeah. I can see what you're thinking. Yeah. And you can sort of, you know, get yourself together and then walk on into the light. But film is so different. Yes, indeed. Which do you prefer? I, I must say I don't really have a preference, I don't think. In just fact, like acting? Yes, I just love... So what's wrong with yourself? Acting. Are you, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, I'm no. Fine. Do you want to be somebody else all the time? <laughs> oh well, I just find it inter I just find it fascinating. I, I mean, I think I started because I loved um, kind of mimicking and pretending, but I've realised now that it's it's not really about that. I, I what I love about it is the ability to be part of a story. So whether you're on stage or or in a, a film, you're part of a, a much bigger story. Mm. And I don't mind how small my role is, and quite often they are pretty small, but as long as I've been there to help create the writer, the director and the yeah. lead actors build their story, build their world, if you like, that's what I love doing. Yeah, mm. no, I can understand that. Do you find you need things like, as we said earlier, like tight shoes or strange belts or different makeup sometimes wigs, extra sometimes hair. I do yes indeed yeah sometimes and, I does, do. and does that help you create the character the the person you're playing yes yeah I mean, I mean probably one of the weirdest roles I ever played was in a Japanese um, uh, action sci-fi series called Ultraman <laughs> which was huge in Japan at the time we shot it here and I was also a sort of a villain in that and um, they said to me as a character brief, he's a sort of a cross between uh, Dr. Strangelove and Andy Warhol. Goodness. I thought, well, that sounds a bit of a challenge. I'll see what I can do with that. So, of course, I had my hair all shocked white and it was all sticking out everywhere. They gave me a fake arm, which took over me sometimes and oh, took yes. control of me and that sort <laughs> of thing. And, a, and I found a voice that went with it. So I built the whole thing out of all these sort of references and I think that character, he, he was in a wheelchair, actually, but he had right. pointy shoes and so on. So all oh, of that gosh, actually I helps to put I the characters together. I remember seeing that. Yeah. I don't think I even knew that was you. And he, he, he um, I remember there was a scene where he got into the spaceship, which was all shot in pretty early days of the green screen technology mm. and so on. So it was a bit primitive, but it worked. And he was controlling the spaceship with his mind. And I loved that idea, too. <laughs> Amazing. But, of course, uh, we've got a couple more shots of characters. Then we'll talk about your most famous role of all. This one here, though. Well, this is you, Macbeth. You look unwell. Yes, he's not well. So this is Macbeth. And, of course, I was already 60, way too old, really, to be playing Macbeth. But we mashed it up with a wonderful um, young director in Adelaide, Yasmin Garibu. She came from the UK. She's been here 10 or 12 years now and has built a wonderful career of her own. She's now um, the artistic director at Act Now Theatre, which mm -hmm. is very much a um, social theatre based around issues and ideas. This production of Macbeth was, was interesting and I was very challenged by it. We, we mashed up the play, we took scenes out of sequence, we gave speeches to other characters, we did all sorts of things with it. But the premise was Macbeth wasn't beheaded or, or murdered at the end of the play, he was imprisoned. And he's been given life in prison, but now he's elderly. They, th they think it's time he was executed. So this is his ah. last night in jail. Right. And through a crazy fantasy, he remembers his past. Right. So we go back to the period as the, the way murder of, of Duncan unfolded and how he was so troubled by it all. And Lady Macbeth becomes somebody that haunts him. You know, they're in love, they're hopelessly in love but he's haunted by her. And the other thing that was interesting about our, that production was it was all male. The cast was all oh, men. Oh, right. OK. And then after interval, if you wanted to stay, you could see another version of the play where the cast were all women. Lots of people chose to come to one or the other or saw both of them on separate nights, but it was a, 
wonderful oh, piece. And we used yeah. we didn't use a theatre. We used a factory right. on the on the um, the site of the old Clipsall factory in to Bowden. To keep to keep that that sort of very it was very gritty. gritty. Yes. Well, this this play this photo isn't so gritty. No, this one is. Um, a production that I did recently, actually, with Charlie Sanders, wonderful young director, graduate of NIDA, who became quite fascinated by the plays of Stephen Sewell. And this one, set in the early 80s, came out of um, Sewell's catalogue, and it's called Welcome the Bright World. Ah. And it's really about the opening up of surveillance. The state surveils its, its citizens. Uh, not like Facebook or, or any of those things mm. that, that are used today. Not like the way that perhaps your mobile is being monitored by exactly. ASIO and or something. Th it's a good prediction of the future. This though, was set in Germany in, uh, in the 1980s and the, um, the, the lead characters are, are, are mathematicians. And my character was a, um, uh, a you know, was, was wanted to use the wonderful world of mathematics to create algorithms because you could do that with mathematics even though computers weren't a big thing hmm. to surveil the whole population of Germany to find out who the traitors were um, a wonderful thriller sort it's of it's all piece a possibility in too. life well, isn't indeed it? it is now it's particularly relevant to today's world yeah, I very think. much yeah. very much if you if you hadn't been an actor what would you have been well uh, as I said to you at the beginning, I started out sort of training to be a doctor. Mm. I think I realised that that wasn't really going to be for me. Good for playing a doctor, though. That was that very background. handy, yes. yes. And, uh, and these days, I, I, rather than doctors, I get to play patients. So I'm back in the same building 50 years on yes. where I trained to be a doctor, well, started out training to be a doctor, playing a patient training medical students. People wouldn't necessarily know that that's how this works because... Obviously, doctors have to get a patient relationship going. Yes, yes. And actors play those roles. We play characters with symptoms. The students are, are, are expected to find out what our symptoms are. We have all the quirks and foibles of just like any other patient. Sometimes the pain's unbearable. Sometimes I don't want my temperature taken. <laughs> you know, I don't like the Not squeeze. Not in that way, doctor. What, the bend over? No. The squeeze on my arm of the yeah. silly blood pressure machine and so on. But it's very useful training, and we get great feedback from it. Mm. So, um, what were we talking about just Well, then? we're talking about the fact we I need to distracted. go to a quick break, and we'll talk a bit more All right. in just a, tack, a tick with Patrick Frost. <laughs> Patrick Frost is our guest. Patrick, what is the most important thing you've done in life? Because I did it too. Well... I've got to say, I think really the most important thing I've done in life is um, be the father of two wonderful no, children. No, not that one, not that and one. grandchildren Not that one, not even. that one. No. It's working with Humphrey Bear. Working with Humphrey Bear. Because oh, that's we how we first met. That. Well, yes, indeed, yes, exactly. And working in children's television uh, was a gift oh, in yes, many ways, indeed. wasn't it? Particularly that character, Humphrey, was just so wonderful and to work with. And your children and grandchildren, they second. Yes, well, yes, kind of, yes, like indeed. In fact, my daughter got to be on Humphrey. She was thrilled. Yes. Oh, isn't that brilliant? Yes. The, the joy of being an actor, though, is on one hand that you get to be lots of other people. Yes. And on the other hand if, is not knowing when you're going to be lots of other people. Well, indeed, yes. So how have you managed to keep your life balanced? Well, I tell people I've been in the gig economy for over 50 years. We invented the gig economy. That's what we call them. They're gigs for us. Yep. And when we're working, we're working. And when we're not, we've got to be sensible. Yep. And uh, Take don't a break spend up too big. Rest you know? up for the next big yes. one. Yes, exactly. So for a young actor, just quickly, what advice would you give a young person who wants to go into the acting game? Um, take it up if you really love it. Get really good at it and then you'll be working. Um, I'm, it's not I'm, about fame, is it? Not really, no, no. I'm, I'm always suspicious now that actors are meant to become producers. They, we call ourselves theatre makers or performers or whatever. I like that, but um, you need to get somebody to employ you and pay you. That's the most important thing, mm. and get paid properly. Make sure you're being paid properly. Mm. Well, as we just said earlier off, off air, we were the two of the people that started 
Actors Equity here, it here was called then. Yes. And yes, it is important for actors to be treated as professional people because Indeed. that's what we all are. Indeed, that's exactly Patrick, it's right. been absolutely lovely to catch up with you again. Thank I'm you so, so pleased much you for the come offer, on the Malcolm. It's a privilege to oh, be here. Not a privilege, it's a privilege for me. It's like old friends as usual. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've had a lovely chat with Patrick and I hope you've enjoyed it too. So until next time on our time, keep yourself nice till then and we'll see you soon. <laughs> oh, for our 500th episode coming up in a few weeks. See you then.